وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور Remember just remember Allah sees it all Alhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalam ala rasulillah All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah We welcome you dear viewers to another in our series In the Names of Allah in the previous episodes, we completed looking at the greatest name of Allah, none other than Allah itself. What we'll be doing in this episode is to be looking at two names of Allah, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, because of the fact that they come from the same root and they carry basically the same meaning. And actually we'll be doing this uh, to a number of other names uh, throughout the program where they share uh, a common root and the differences between them are very fine. Then rather than taking each one separately, we'll combine them into one segment. Uh, we will look at them and the differences between them, but we will treat them together uh, in one segment of the names of Allah. So, as we said, name number two and three is Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Translated as the beneficent and the most merciful. In terms of the Quran, where we can find it in the Quran, because as we said, the names of Allah which are acceptable, will be those that can be extracted from the Qur'an or the Sunnah. We said that they are not uh, subject to our human interpretation, human uh, deductions, etc. Otherwise, we'll come up with names which Allah did not intend. So, we restrict ourselves to those found in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So what we'll be dealing with, the first set of names that we'll be looking at, are those that are mentioned exclusively in the Qur'an. Or they may be also mentioned in the Sunnah, but we can find them all in the Qur'an. When we complete the number of names that are available in the Qur'an, then we'll go on to the Sunnah to look at names not found in the Qur'an, but found in the in the Sunnah. So these two names, Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim, are found in the Quran in a number of different places. In the case of the name Ar Rahman, it is found 57 times in the Quran. Among the verses, we can find in Surah Maryam, the 19th chapter, verse 93, in which Allah says, In kulluman fis samawati wal ard, Illa ata ata rahmani abda. All in the heavens and the earth come to God, the beneficent, as a servant. And uh, in terms of ar Rahim, we can find Allah saying in Surah Al Baqarah, for example, verse 54 Inna hu huwa tawwab ar Rahim. Indeed, He is the oft forgiving the most merciful. And also in Surah Al-Fatiha, the second verse after Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. So they're both there also. Anyway, in terms of the meaning, both names come from the, the Arabic root Rahmah, which means mercy. And both of them 
are what are called intensive forms of the present participle. The original form Rahim becomes Rahman and Rahim. Now, both of them, f fundamentally we're saying, means merciful, but there are some subtle differences between the two, uh, particularly when we look at it in relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of the technical, uh, grammatical, or lexological uh, definition or, or opinions with regards to Rahim and Rahman, Rahman is looked at as being a more intensive form than Rahim because the intensive forms, uh, depending on the number of letters that, that constitute them, the more letters, the more intensive they're considered to be. And Rahman has more letters than a Rahim. But in terms of the understanding with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the general explanation which is commonly given, and most people are familiar with it, is that Rahman is one who possesses complete mercy for the creatures of this world and for the believers in the next, covering both worlds, this world and the next. Whereas Rahim is more specific for the believers on the Day of Judgment. That's the most common uh, explanation which is given with regards to the difference between the two. However, there is a verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 143, which creates a problem for this interpretation. That's the verse in which Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِالنَّاسِ لَرَعُوفُ rahim." Indeed, Allah is compassionate and merciful to people. So this is a general verse using the attribute Rahim in regards to everyone not specifically to the believers. So that uh, previous definition works fine to a certain degree, but it has its problems. A more accurate uh, distinction between the two can be found in terms of how they are used in describing Allah. In the case of Ar-Rahman, this is a description of Allah's essence of him in character himself. Whereas Rahim describes his actions. And if one looks at the various verses in the Quran where these two terms are used, you'll find it consistently being used in this way. That whenever Allah uses the term Ar-Rahman, he would use it uh, not as a description of his actions. Whereas Rahim, we will see it in that way. For example, in Surah Al Ahzab, verse 43, and he is merciful to the believers. You will not find Rahman being used in a similar way. Instead, you find uh, Rahman being used in a way equivalent to Allah's name, the greatest name. Allah. For example, we find in Surah Al-Isra where Allah says there, قُلِ ادْعُوا اللَّهُ عِدُوا الرَّحْمَانِ أَيَّمْ مَا تَدْعُوا فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى Say, call on Allah or call on the most merciful. Whoever you call on, the most beautiful names belong to him. So it's used in the same way as, as Allah is a name given to Allah. Describing Allah in his essence not his actions. Similarly, Ar-Rahman is used in the same way. Whereas Rahim, for example, we find even used to describe the Prophet. In Surah Tawbah, verse 128, we find Allah saying there, describing the Prophet ﷺ, حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ that Prophet Muhammad was concerned about you and compassionate and merciful to the believers. So uh, the name Allah and Rahman are given as equivalents 
and Rahman is used as a name to describe Allah in general, and it's never used to describe anyone other than Allah. Whereas Rahim is used to describe the Prophet Wasallam, and in general, when it's used in regards to Allah, it's used to describe His actions. Now, to understand uh, this name of Allah, because we said that as we strive to worship Allah through His names, as He said, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا To Allah belongs all the beautiful names, so call on Him with them, worship Him through them. We said, it started by understanding the meaning of the name, then understanding it with regards to Allah's creatures. I mean, understanding the meaning in and of itself, then we go to look at it with regards to Allah's creatures. And what we see in terms of the creation and Allah's mercy is that His mercy is vast. It encompasses everything. And He states that Himself in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 156, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ My mercy encompasses everything. So, whatever exists in this world exists within the mercy of Allah. Whether we're talking about the righteous and the unrighteous people and the jinn, whether we're talking about believers or disbelievers, where in the heavens or in the earth, all creatures, all beings that have an understanding and can choose, the sentient beings, all of them function within the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, we did say, as we said before, that there is a special element of Allah's mercy which is reserved for the believers on the Day of Judgment. And that element is actually the greater element of Allah's mercy. There is a hadith uh, which Prophet Muhammad related in which he said, Indeed, when Allah created mercy, He created it in 100 parts. He kept 99 parts with Himself and released one part into the world for His whole creation. By it they have compassion and mercy among themselves. With it the wild animals have compassion for their offspring. So much so that the beast lifts its hoof from its offspring for fear of trampling it. And Allah delays 99 parts to show mercy to His servants on the day of resurrection. That is something really amazing. The greater portion of Allah's mercy is saved for the believers on the day of judgment. But what that single portion, one out of a hundred, is enough to govern and cover all aspects of Allah's creation. So much so that the wild animal will spare its offspring. With that, dear viewers, we're going to take a break and we'll be coming back to further look at this immense, this tremendous attribute of Allah, the attribute of mercy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When you are weak and the road seems long, remember, just remember, seek strength from the strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome to Perspectives. I'm your host, Musa McGuire. There are 11 million, you know, not 1 million, not 3 million, 11 million people, uh, children under five, that die every year. I mean, it's mind-boggling, and nobody cares. It is an action uh, and the movement from the people's side. You cannot press a button and say, well, stop at this point. Well, they have been hurted, and that is a reaction. We can go to those big countries, and we tell them, you are producing this TV or this machine, and this small part of it, I can make it better, smaller and less expensive so 
while Islam would allow in vitro fertilization outside the uterus from uh, the uh, emerit man and woman and then implanted in the uterus of this woman. When you are weak and the road seems long, remember, just remember, seek strength from the strong. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. I welcome you back, dear viewers, to our series, In the Names of Allah. And in this segment of our series, we're looking at two of Allah's names, which are related to His vast mercy, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Before the break, we looked at it from a linguistic perspective, and we began following that to look at its general meaning with regards to Allah and we said that the name Ar-Rahman refers to Allah's essence whereas the name Rahim refers to or is used to refer to his actions. And then we started to look at the vastness of Allah's mercy as he said وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ My mercy encompasses everything Surah Al-A'raf verse 156 but then Prophet Muhammad went on to elaborate on this, to give us an even deeper picture of the vastness of Allah's mercy. He said that Allah created mercy in a hundred parts. And 99 parts He kept for the believers on the Day of Judgment. And one part He sent into this world. And that one part is the basis of people uh, being compassionate with each other, loving each other, all of the love, etc., that exists in the world. So much so that even the wild animal has mercy on its offspring. It has compassion towards its offspring. And that's something that it's worth reflecting on. Um, why a wild animal, which we know is so vicious, you come in its presence, a lion or a tiger... A leopard will tear you to pieces without any hesitation. Not because it's angry at you, but that's just its nature. As a wild animal and a carnivorous animal, it will eat when its food is presented to it and it's hungry, it will eat whatever. Yet, it has offspring. And it doesn't eat its own offspring. What stops it from eating its own offspring? That's really something amazing if one just stops to think about it. And as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, that the animal, those that have hoofs like a horse or uh, a camel or whatever, these are the animals, when they give birth and their offspring is small and it's drinking from them, whatever, drinking milk, you know, it is careful not to trample its offspring. What stops it from doing that? What gives it that care and concern? That same horse, if it was a wild horse, for example, you would not be able to ride it. It's not controlled. It's not uh, tame. You know, so it's wild. But with its offspring, it's careful. And that is from the one part of Allah's mercy which He has put in the world. That even the wildest of animals cares, has compassion for its offspring. Furthermore, if we look at uh, Allah's mercy from the perspective of His anger and His mercy, what we find is that the vastness of His mercy puts, the, puts precedence on His mercy over his anger. And this is based on Allah's statement when he said in a number of places in the Quran describing himself settling on the throne, he said, Ar Rahmanu al al istawa, for example in Surah Taha, verse five, the most merciful is established on his throne. Allah brings together two attributes or two qualities. 
One, the throne, it's not an attribute of Allah, but it is an attribute of His creation. You know, one of the parts of His creation, which He has made the vastest and the greatest of His creation. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ had said, describing the whole of creation in relationship to the footstool. Footstool, which is less than the throne. The Prophet ﷺ said that the whole of creation, the whole universe, everything that exists in relationship to the footstool is like a brass ring thrown in the middle of a boundless desert. A vast desert. As it falls, it is invisible. You can't even see it. And the footstool in relationship to Allah's throne is also like a brass ring thrown into a boundless desert. So what are we talking about here in terms of the throne? The vastness of the throne is incomprehensible. It is the greatest part of Allah's creation. So, Allah, in these verses where He talks about establishing Himself on His throne, being established on the throne, settling on the throne, He uses, on one hand, the biggest and greatest aspect of His creation, and then He describes Himself as Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman al He uses His greatest attribute, which is most all-inclusive and comprehensive, Ar-Rahman. His mercy, which covers everything. So when he put these two things together, talking about the vastness of his throne, which sits over all of his creation, and then combines that with his mercy, he is emphasizing to us that the dominion which is his in its vastness is encompassed by his mercy in its totality. There is no aspect of that creation, the creation in which we live, that is not touched by the mercy of Allah. That is how vast it is. This is what we're talking about. Now, not only does Allah inform us that, but he, may, he takes a step further. And based on the implications of that relationship, him being the most merciful, the all-merciful, and all-inclusive in his mercy, which covers the whole of his dominion, He writes for himself, he records for himself that mercy would be an obligation on himself. Stressing precedence given to mercy. So he said in Surah Al-An'am, 6th chapter, verse 54, كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ Your Lord has ordained on himself mercy. He has ordained it on himself. Why? Because no one could make it obligatory on Allah. No one can command Allah to do anything, nor can anyone prevent him from doing anything. No one can prevent him. So, the precedence given to his mercy, this is by his own choice. He chooses to give precedence to it over all else, and in particular, over his anger, because that's the opposite. His mercy, he's merciful, and he's angry, upset with whatever is done against his commands, which he permits, because of course we cannot do anything without him allowing us to do it. But Prophet Muhammad elaborated on this verse 
your Lord has ordained on himself mercy. Kataba rabbukum ala nafsi rahma. He said, as narrated by Abu Huraira, when Allah created the creation, he wrote in his book, obliging himself, indeed my mercy will conquer my anger, and it is placed near him on the throne. Indeed, my mercy will conquer my anger, and it was placed with him on the throne. So, Allah has obliged himself, made an obligation on himself, that his mercy would precede his anger. That is an expression of the vastness of his mercy. So, somebody could then ask, as they do ask, if that is the case, why does his mercy, Allah's mercy, not cause him to release the doomed souls from hell? Doesn't those souls who are going to be in hell forever, burning in hell forever, isn't that indicative that his anger, in this case, precedes or conquers his mercy? That is a question which is commonly asked. And it's something worth reflecting on. Why is Allah's mercy only limited to a certain area or a certain group or whatever? Well, in this sense, yes. His mercy does include people who end up in hell. Because he does remove from hell some people who are doomed there. There's a narration from the Prophet ﷺ, which was collected by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, in which he said that Allah, after the angels had interceded, and the messengers had interceded, and the believers had interceded, and no one remained to intercede except the most merciful of the merciful, he will then take a handful from the fire and bring out of it people who never did any good and who had been turned into charcoal and cast them into a river called the river of life on the outskirts of paradise. They will sprout as seeds from the silt carried by the flood. This is the promise of the Prophet. So Allah's mercy even reaches the inhabitants of hell. Anyway, dear viewers, we're going to stop here and uh, continue in our next episode. We'll continue to look at this idea because it does work, need a little more uh, reflection uh, to answer this particular question. But fundamentally, Allah's mercy, as he said, encompasses everything and it precedes his anger. And this is the greatness of those divine names, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. With that, dear viewers, I bid you all farewell, and I hope to see you in our next episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When you are weak and the road seems long, remember, just remember, seek strength from the strong.